Hello, everybody. My name is Nick. I'm the media coordinator here at Notre Dame. A couple announcements before we get started. Tomorrow night, we are having an in-person Latin Mass, 7.30 p.m. in the church. Uh, for those unable to attend, we will be live streaming on Facebook, so be sure to look out there if you're looking for the uh, virtual version. Uh, next Thursday, we'll be having an outdoor holy hour with Father Michael Duffy as the guest speaker. It will be on the front lawn of the school. If it rains or if the weather isn't cooperating, we will move it into the church, so just keep an eye out on Facebook for a day of updates on that if the weather becomes a problem. Uh, next weekend, we are having the annual uh, joint feast of St. Chavara and St. Thomas. Uh, Mass will be at 5.30 p.m. on the front lawn of the school. Same thing. If it rains, we'll move it inside, so just keep a lookout for updates on that. Another big important thing is that the Mass Book for 2021 is opening tomorrow. So uh, you can go to our website, NotreDameNHP.com. There's a big blue button under the uh, Important Information section. If you hit that, it'll give you the form, and it'll give you the instructions on how to do that. All right, so here they are, Father Scalero and Father McCaldy. How are you guys doing? I'm doing all right, Nick. How are you doing? I'm doing great. <laughs> I'm very excited. to. This is our last Matthew study. I know. It's a good run. I, I feel like it's been it's been a marathon. It's four, yeah. It's, we were over eager, I think. Is this the four weeks week? in yeah. a row? <laughs> now that we can actually, you know, we have math and all these things again. The digital stuff, it's, uh, you know, it's very different now. Yeah. That we can see people. Yeah, not stuck in our houses anymore. So, okay. So, uh, before we get started, Father Sclera, want to lead us in the Pater Noster. Good thing. Nome Patris, the Filii, the Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Pater Noster, qui es in Cielis, Sanctificator, Nomen Tum, Advenia, Trenium Tum, Fiat Comunitas Tua, Sicut in Cielo, et in Terra. Pana Nostrum, Quotidianum, et Nobis Soliae, et Dimitri Nobis Devinti Nostra, Sicut et Nos Dimitrimus Devitoribus Nostris, et ne Nos Inducas in Tentationum, et Liber Nos Malum. Spiritus Sancti. Amen. All right, so... Uh... Handing it over to you guys. Here, here we go. <laughs> All right. Um, so I guess just to catch up on last week, a reminder, if you have any thoughts, comments, particularly as we're closing up the gospel, if you have any large-scale questions as well, um, feel free to, to pop them into the comment box. Um, but just to sort of review, again, I think the benefit of reading straight to a gospel is hopefully we're getting the, the dramatic arc of the story. We began you know, with the birth of Christ, and we started to... Matthew has these series of teachings, this sort of a, a, a teaching moment followed by a narrative. So we had the Sermon on the Mount, and then he goes out and he sort of matches his words with his actions, the healings, to these miraculous activities. So he teaches the doctrine, and then he lives it, which is sort of a nice balance, and it's a good model for all of us. And as we saw the dramatic arc grow, we see people are increasingly interested in him and engaged in what he's doing. We think of the feeding of the 5,000 large crowds coming to him, asking to be healed, you know, pressing in upon him. And at the same time, we have this growing leeriness on the part of the, the Pharisees and the Jewish leaders. They begin to question him. There's clashes about, that's how we sort of ended last week, is Jesus, with the cursing of the fig tree and the parable of the two sons, the parable of the wicked tenants, he starts to go that extra step to say, not only am I bringing you this positive message, but beware of these sort of the failings of the, the faith that you practice now, how it's incomplete. So Christ is sort of doubling down on you know, the stone that's rejected by the builders. There's going to be this rejection of the truth that will lead to this transformation of the Jewish faith. So we're sort of setting it up. The remainder of the, the story, obviously, we're going to sort of see that that tension increased between Jesus and the Jewish leaders, but it ultimately leads to the passion, death, and resurrection. Hopefully, um, all of us recognize from Palm Sunday when we were in year A, like we just read this year, uh, which you follow virtually, uh, you, you, you hear this passion, and hopefully a lot of it is stuff we've reflected on before, and especially in the Lenten season, has deepened our appreciation. So uh, we'll dive in, and let's, uh, Father Miguel, if you've got anything to uh, open us up with. No, I'm, I think you did a very good summary. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm proud of you. you you're really <laughs> getting good at this. You know, after four weeks, I think eventually we'll figure out how this works, right? All right. So, uh, chapter 22. Uh, so, we start off with some more parables. 
we're at the uh, the marriage feast. Um, so we're sort of again looking at the image of the Jewish people falling short of living up to their promise. So the master sends out invites um, the people to the wedding feast. And the wedding feast is an image of the kingdom of eternal life. Um, and and what happens? Those who are invited, they refuse the invitation. They um, they see servants, treat them shamefully, kill them. So we see, of course, he's referring to the Jewish leaders who are re- rejected the prophets and all those who are pointing, leading to Christ. So they're seen as, he says, they're not worthy, so go out and take everybody into the streets. So what is this preparing us for? The Jewish people are going to be almost displaced by the Gentiles, by all people who will be invited. So we open this tribal religion. Um, we didn't quite get to Exodus, but we talked about, you know, the the, son, the 12 sons of Israel. You know, this is a family, a tribe. When we get to the Exodus, all the people united under the law. They're the ones who are God's people, not anybody else. This is our God. And all of a sudden, everybody's invited to the banquet. Uh, but what's interesting is everybody's invited, but even though he invites everybody, what happens at the end? Um, where is their wedding garment? So we see even here, if they're not ready, they're cast into the outer darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. So again, this is the tough Jesus we don't talk about very much. Um, he talks about hell. He talks about this place where those people go who aren't prepared for heaven. So it gives us an image, okay, what's life about? Preparing our souls, the wedding garment, for eternal life. And I, that's an image I often use of confession. What happens? We sin, there's a tear in our souls. Confession sews it back together, but when we get to the end of our lives, you know, there's a lot of, you know, ripped up, torn, stained, um, you know, it's it's repaired, but it's that's what the purgatory does, that final cleansing. So the wedding garment is almost an image of our soul that God willing, we prepare well enough that we're clean of guilt, and then it's the final preparations of, of purgatory. Um, so, in the next passage, we see the Pharisees try to, cap, to sort of trap Christ. We're seeing they're a little more aggressive. You know, what about paying the tax? You know, should we pay tax to deceive or to trap him? So he says no, then the, the public authorities will be upset if the, he says yes. Well, the Jewish people are upset that he's supporting these Roman uh, colonizers, these Roman emperors who are, who are suppressing, oppressing them. Um, so what does do, Jesus do? He sort of tricks them. He says, well, whose face is on the coin? You know, of course, it's Caesar. So, okay, just give to Caesar what is Caesar's. Don't be concerned with worldly things. Your focus is on giving to God what is his. So he skirts the question and almost shows them that their worries are inconsequential and worldly. Their eyes aren't on the eternal. Again, chapter verse 23, they they try to trick Christ. These are the Sadducees, the Jewish leaders, the high priests who don't believe in the resurrection. So they're, because Christ has been talking about this idea, they say, well, in our law, you know, if a brother dies, his wife goes to the next brother, and if that brother dies, he goes to the next. Um, and sort of the brother gets tested on. What if this happened seven times? Who is the woman married to in eternity if there's this resurrection? Of course, Christ, again, he outsmarts them, and he, he says, you know, there is no marriage in heaven. Um, and that's, that's maybe a teaching most people aren't aware of. We say till death do us part, because marriage ends with death. Um, so he's emphasizing marriage has the purpose of each person helping the other get to heaven, and he sort of skips over this whole little minor squabble of the law that the Sadducees are caught up in. Um, so I think that's also good to think about just as, as married people. You know, I'm not married just at the time where it's not the sentimental idea. My job is to help my spouse get to heaven. Their job is to get me to heaven. That is what marriage is about. The relationship goes into eternity, like a relationship with anybody, but marriage is a means to an end. Um, verse 34, again, they sort of are, are challenging, questioning it. What's the greatest commandment in the law? He says, love your God with all your heart and your soul and all your mind, and uh, love your neighbor as yourself. So, again, he sums up the Ten Commandments, number one through three, love of God, number uh, four through ten, love the neighbor. And finally, they sort of say, so what do you think of the Christ? You know, he's the son of David. How is this possible? Then Christ sort of, again, flips it on them. Well, in the Psalms, David talks about the Messiah as his Lord. So he challenges them to start to think, well, how is a descendant of David greater than David himself? So you start to get them to think, you know, this Christ 
pre-existed David, and yet he'll be a descendant of David. So he's sort of throwing all these little ideas to, to stir them up and challenge them and start to break down their preconceptions. Um, so, yeah, Father Mokalpi, any thoughts on chapter 22? Well, I missed half of it because I disappeared for a little bit. The yeah. Like <laughs> I started calling the Vester because I noticed you weren't there anymore. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I just think that it's important. All of these things, when looking at it with the, the subjective lens that we talked about in the beginning, that I think there are moments where we might cling to things that we need to let go of. And if Christ is not at the center of the things that we're holding on to, right, that becomes a problem. A lot of times today, we can mix our Catholicism with other things. And then there are some things that we can start holding in higher authority um, than our Catholicism, right? Like, it, there, there's a temptation sometime, I think, especially in our current climate, to hold uh, political things ahead of our Catholicism or, or merge our political uh, thoughts and ideas with our Catholicism. But as we know, there's no party that fully encapsulates what the church teaches. And ultimately, we should be Catholic first, we should be disciples first, and then everything kind of comes from there. So there could be that temptation sometimes to shoehorn other things into our faith that don't necessarily belong there. And we have to remember to keep Christ at the center, right? Render unto Caesar what Caesar's, but what God is, is God. And he comes, he comes first. There's been many Caesars, but there's only one God. Yeah, that's and, and that's you know everybody has a God in their life, something that they they aim for in all that they do. And it's a good question to ask ourselves. You know, when asked, why do I do this? Well, why? Well, why? Well, why? You're going to trace back eventually. Well, is it I want to get money? I want to be happy? I want to you know, get things? Or is it I want to serve God and be with Him forever? That's sort of the question. That's the hope that the answer when we ask why. Yeah. So. Uh, Chapter 23, here we get, so Christ starts to go after the scribes and Pharisees. Now he's starting to, to really to show the failings of the sort of the Mosaic covenant that they haven't lived up to it. They fall short of its spirit in the focus on the law. So he talks about um, the scribes and the Pharisees who sit on Moses' seat. Um, they practice and observe whatever they tell you, but not what they do. Um, they preach, but do not practice. They bind heavy burdens, hard to bear them and shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with a finger. Um, so it talks about the law is becoming a burden. It's all this external weight on the Jewish people. It's all about, you know, don't, you know, we know the Sabbath laws, and you know, don't put the light switch. Don't, well, what is the point of all this? It's just, it's not about love of God. It's about the observance of the cold law. And of course, he talks about their pride. They, uh, Verse 5, they do these deeds to be seen by men, but they make their phylacteries broad and their fringes long. So phylacteries, a Jewish uh, man would wear on his forehead and his arm during prayer these lines of scripture wrapped in scrolls. So what happens if you make them bigger, you look more pious. You've got these big sort of images of prayer on you. So what are they, that's what it's all about, external, external, showing off your spirituality. Um, and he's sort of there's authority, call no man father, you know, call no man master. This, they're sort of lording over the people, this, this sense of they know the law. They'll tell you what you need to do to be righteous. Um, and he goes on, of course, in the, in each, starting verse 13, verse 16, verse 23, 25, 27, 29, there's these woes. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You shut the kingdom of heaven against men. Um, so, you, you convert somebody, actually, because you convert somebody, make them twice as much a child to tell. They're so passionate about the law that it just makes them more miserable. Blind guides who swear by the temple. Um, so they swear by the gold of the temple and not the temple. They make these minor distinctions when they make these oaths as if it makes a difference. Um, you tithe mint and dill and cumin, but have neglected the weightier matters of the law. You're so worried about these little things that you forget about justice and mercy and faith, you straining out a gnat and swallowing a cow, something very vivid. So they're worried about the little gnat, this tiny little bit of the law, and yet they're, they're, they're accepting these terrible violations of the law, the camel. Um, you clean the outside of the cup and the plate, but inside you're full of extortion or opacity, 
So what do they do? It's all about washing your hands, you know, these ritual purifications of vessels. We think of the Passover. There's all these rules about eliminating leaven. And again, it's all sick inside. This is one of my favorite, you know, gospel insults. You're like whitewashed tombs, which outwardly appear beautiful, but within they're full of dead men's bones and uncleanness. Um, what a brilliant image, you know. And this is something we can think of any hypocrite. Uh, anybody who puffs themselves up and looks, you know, righteous and speaks in a pious way, but inside it's all sin, and death, and, and brokenness. Um, and you sort of breaking down. This is what it's all become, this external, empty observance of a law, not a love of God, and an interior spiritual transformation. That's what the prophets were all about, pointing the Jewish people to go beyond just the letter of the law, to develop that spirit of love and care for the, the orphan and the marginalized. And of course, they've kept the easy part, the exterior. Um, and the final, and this is actually very timely. Um, what do you scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites? We build the tombs of the prophets and adorn the monuments of the righteous, saying, if we had lived in the days of our fathers, we would not have taken part with them in the shedding of the blood of the prophets. Um, and I think there's no better image than in a time where there's this almost historical cleansing. We're arguing about, you know, characters in history. So what happens when we vilify somebody in history? We're saying, I wouldn't have done that if I were them. But who are we to say that? You know, we're products of our own time. If, if I were this person, how am I to know if I would act differently? You know, we can think of those parallels of something like abortion. How many people support abortion today when maybe in 100 years people realize what a crime against humanity is, this, the dehumanization of millions of infants? Um, who will be to say, oh, you know, I would have never stood for that? And so many people stand for it today. There's an arrogance as if we're better than our ancestors. So he's almost challenging them. You think, oh, you wouldn't have killed the prophets. Well, of course they would have killed the prophets. You know, it's evident that they're rejecting Christ now. So they would have rejected Ezekiel and Isaiah in his time. I think all of us can look into our hearts and say, sure, we can say, oh, that's bad, but they did in the past. But look at our own sinfulness. Would we have acted differently? Aren't we just as imperfect and a product of our times as they were. And so the gospel ends with this lament over Jerusalem, most Jerusalem, Jerusalem, killing the prophets and stoning those who are sent to you. How often would I get gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under wings, and you would not. Behold, your house is forsaken and desolate, for I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, Blessed be to you who comes in the name of the Lord. So this final sort of act of sorrow, you know, we've given you this chance, we've invited you over and over and yet you rejected me. So, dramatic chapter 23. Any thoughts, Father? Yeah, and I think as Christians today, that idea of hypocrisy is something that we very much have to pay attention to. Because a lot of times, the, those who are, to use strong language, those who are our enemies, those who are against us, right? There are people who hate Christianity. There are people who would like to, to tear it down. That, that exists. We'd be foolish not to think that that's not the case. Uh, with that, we have to be good examples because if all the things that we do can be perceived as doing them for show, then, uh, you know, what would be the purpose, right? I know one of the big, and I'm not saying this is, this is what actually goes on. Uh, one of my, I, I don't, I'm not like a Twitter person. I, I know what it is, though. <laughs> and it was this, there was this big thing um, about, like, attacking the pro-life movement, basically saying you care about the unborn, but you don't care about them once they are born, right? There was this big attack. And then there was this great video made by all of these people who are pro-life about how, you know, we do fundraisers for the mothers. I started a halfway home in which – Mothers can come and, and get acclimated to their new babies and we help them get jobs and we do this and we do. And it was like all these people came out and said all of these things that they were doing. But if there is a person there who says they're pro-life, but really all they are is anti-abortion and then they don't care about the, the, Well, then that defeats the purpose, right? Then you're, it, it becomes a whole different thing. So in our own lives, right, it's very important to see where do I miss the mark? Where do I fall short? To admit that, right, 
and not to hold ourselves in high esteem because of embarrassment. I'm going to make myself look better than I am because I'm embarrassed to admit that I'm a sinner. No, admit that you're a sinner. Embrace the fact that you're a sinner. Not like, oh, it's okay to be a sinner. That's not what I mean. But as we realize that we're fallen, as we realize that we're broken, and then we realize we need Jesus, that the hypocrisy then um, plagues us less. And then we can be faithful witnesses. Because Jesus came and they can see that he had authority that was unlike that of the Pharisees who lauded these things over people, but then, then weren't there when it really mattered. And now as I'm saying this, the lights are flickering. So <laughs> if I lose power, it's been fun. <laughs> yeah, and that's, and that's even and that's the difference in Christ is that he is the perfect one who can speak in this way. All of us, even as priests, what do we do? We say, I too am a sinner, and we're all striving to grow in holiness. We're all striving to observe these laws, even though we're imperfect. That beautiful image of Pope Francis going to confession. You know, Mother Teresa, who so frequently went to confession, you can speak of the dangers of sin if you're willing to admit you're a sinner yourself. We won't say, all of you sinners, you guys got to stop. Well, then the moment anybody sees you fall short, what a hypocrite, what a liar. You know, he doesn't stand by what he believes himself. But if we admit weakness, it allows us to, to connect on that human level, not stand over others. Right. And betray our, our faith. All right. Uh, chapter 24. So a historical note worth mentioning. Um, so in 70 AD, the temple was destroyed by the Romans. Um, there was an uprising. The temple came to be destroyed. So some scholars would theorize that um, that Matthew wrote this, or it was edited, or whatever it was, subsequent to the destruction of the temple. So when you talk about these prophecies, he's writing and putting words. And that's sort of a technical question, but... Um, we do see that Christ speaks very clearly. Um, he says, you, you see all these, do not true, they say to you, they'll not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. So he, he sort of predicts, not only will the physical temple be destroyed, maybe the important part is the spiritual reality of the temple. Um, again, something we talked about in our Genesis class, there's this idea of a localized access to God. What happens when, they, when as Israel has a dream? He prepares an altar. This is a special place where God is present. Um, you know, this is where I encountered him. The temple where the ark was, where once the ark was gone, this is the privileged place of encounter with God. No, no, no. Christ is coming to destroy the temple as a as a locale. God is everywhere. And now across the world, we can build churches in which we can bless the sacrament, we can reside, and we can encounter him. Um, we can pray where two or three are gathered. So he's breaking down that that tribal localized religion into and sort of expanding it to be a, a global, you know, all penetrating faith. So this is sort of called the eschatological discourse, but now Christ looks to the end of time. Um, so maybe another note, we have to be careful with prophecies. So there's a lot of points here where, where Christ says, this is going to happen, this is going to happen. It's so when people say, this is happening now, it's the end of the world. And this seems to happen throughout history is when any sort of, prophecy seems to be fulfilled, it's like, oh, end of the world, let's get worried. Like the millennium, like a thousand years ago, they thought that was the end of the world. Back in the beginning, after Christ died, he makes a comment, we'll see it, you know, no, this generation will not pass before the end. Um, so they said, oh, like before I die, the end of the world will come. So, but he also says, this is later, um, verse 36, that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven or the Son, but the Father only. So Christ, even in his humanity, isn't aware of when the end will come. So maybe just as a note, we shouldn't get too caught up in this idea like, when's the end of the world? Let's prepare. Let's look at the signs. You know, prophecies, you don't know they're fulfilled until they're fulfilled. You know, the suffering servant of Isaiah that spoke of how Christ would be beaten and bloodied and, you know, horrible to look upon. It was only in the crucifixion that we realized the fulfillment of that prophecy. So, um, so you really, it's something, it's an insight to, to, to reflect on. So these are signs of, of a dark time or the time of turning from Christ. But we shouldn't jump to this is the end of time. Um, so, so we see he talks about the signs. This is in the area of verse 3. The new wars, wars and rumors of wars, um, nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom, famine and earthquakes. Um, 
in, in verse 9, he starts to talk about tribulations when we put to death and hated by all nations for my name's sake. Many will fall away, betray one another, hate one another. Many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. Uh, most men's love will grow cold. That can certainly sound like our own times, but many times in history, this has been the case where um, where there has been this, this falling cold to the gospel. We go to verse 15, um, where he, he speaks of this desolating sacrilege. So the, the book of Daniel, a Syrian king, places a, st- places a statue of Zeus in the Holy of Holies in the temple, this horrifying idea of replacing the true God with this mock God, this idol. Um, and that, again, is another image against the time. And, and that's something that is happening now. People have placed other idols in their lives besides God himself, money and power and, and satisfaction. Um, so, again, signs of a dark time. But whether it's the end of time, we don't know yet. Um, the false prophets who, who sort of who do these great signs and wonders and lead people away from God. Think of technology, all these amazing things that people can do that say, okay, don't believe in God. He's, he's not the true God. You know, trust in science. Um, well, a better image of what he's talking about. Um, but it, it ends, this is verse 27. For as the lightning comes from the east and shines as far as the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. So very, you will know when Christ is coming. That's how clear it will be. Like the lightning, you will know when it is coming. Um, so he, he talks he immediately after the tribulation. This is verse 29. Sun will be dark and the moon will not give light. Um, so he talks about these signs, him coming on the clouds with heaven and power and glory. So he talks about the signs leading up. This is the coming of Christ. Um, he, he looks, verse 32, from the fig tree, less, um, you can tell as the branch becomes tender, puts forth fruit, you know, summer is near. So this will all show you that the Son of Man is coming. And then, so, with all this preparation, then what does he say? Verse 36, you don't know the day or the hour, so be prepared. Just as with Noah's flood, you know, people were doing everything, going about their business. The flood came and they were destroyed. So too will the end of time. It will surprise us. So we say be vigilant. You know, just as the householder does know when the thief is coming, we don't know when the end of time. Be ready. Um, verse 45 it talks about the faithful and the wise servant who, who's just waiting for his master to come, taking care of the home, being prudent and, and responsible. What does the bad servant do? Uh, my master's not going to be a while. I'm going to have a good time, let things go to pot, and then I'll clean it up when, when he's coming. Well, you never know it's going to come and you'll be, you'll be stuck. You'll be, again, you'll be weeping and gnashing your teeth. Um, so he's giving this prediction. It, this, there's these signs, this might happen, but the most important thing is you're not going to know, so prepare your soul. Always be ready because it could be a minute from now, an hour from now, a week from now, a year from now. It doesn't matter. You should always be ready. Um, so a bit of a darker chapter. <laughs> what do you have to say about the world? Everyone who's ever predicted the end of the world has been wrong. Because we're still here. <laughs> True. And, yeah, I, I, that preparedness is something that you have to be ready. You have to be ready to go and meet Jesus tomorrow or today, right? Like when I wake up in the morning, I have to be ready to meet him today. Um, and and at, at every moment, I have to be ready to, to, to meet him. So th- this idea of when is the end of the world going to be, does it matter? No. Because... I don't know when I'm going to die. You don't know when you're going to die. And and so it's important that we're ready to meet Christ at any moment. And if we're there during the, the end of uh, the world, if we're there during the you know all of this, then we pray for that strength to be faithful and remain faithful. And I think that you know the more you we study Scripture, the more the voice of Christ becomes clear. So that when you hear those false prophets, right, because there's not just one, there's many false prophets over the course of history, before Christ and after Christ, that when we hear those false prophets, because we know the voice of Jesus, we won't buy into it. And that's why studying scripture is so important. And even people talk about, you know, discernment of spirits. Where is the voice of God in my life? Well, if, if we do get to know his voice, you hear the voice of the shepherd, you'll know well, what does God want me to do here? Well, when you pray, I know this is what God wants from me. There's a clarity because we know what he 
Yes. Yeah. All right. Chapter 25. Um, again, we're continuing. And hopefully we're seeing, you know, if we're seeing this as a long story, this is a very dramatic sort of preparation for the climax. Um, so chapter 25, in verse 1, he, he talks about 10 maidens um, waiting to meet the bridegroom. They've all got their, their candles. One, you know, some are prudent. They've saved their oil for the time. Others, it all runs out. They fall asleep. And what happens? They miss out. They're sort of locked out in the darkness because they weren't ready. In verse 14, the parable of the talents. This is one I'm sure most of us are familiar with. This master gives, you know, to them different numbers of talents, five, you know, two, one, um, and, and he goes away. And then what do they do with the talents? Well, one multiplies and so he gets more, the other does the same, and one varies them. And, what is, and he, he corrects him, he says, you know, what have you made interest if you just put it in a bank? You know, you've wasted and squandered this gift. Um, so what does this show us? Well, while God is away, while we're here, he's given us his grace, he's given us the sacraments, he's given us the potential to, to live out his call, to become saints, to make this world a better place, whatever, however you want to speak of it, to become holy. What do we do with that gift? Christ died for us. He gave us something of infinite value. Do we squander it, worrying about worthy things? Um, and it, in itself, it multiplies. Just as the money makes interest, God's life in our soul it increases itself if we just let God work. That's how almost easy it is. If we surrender ourselves to Him, it can grow. So, again, this is our job then. So, we don't know the day or the hour, so what should we be doing? We should be preparing by making good use of the gifts God has given us. And, and verse 31 begins the final story. Again, the final image, which I'm sure we're very familiar with. So the Son of Man will come. This is a summary. Uh, he'll sit on his glorious throne. All nations will come before him. And he'll separate the sheep from the goats. It's right in his last so Again, a clear reference. There will be two places you can go for all eternity. Some to be with God forever. Some who do not wish to be with him will go apart. And what, what sets them apart? Um, when I was hungry, you gave me food. When I was thirsty, you gave me drink. You visited me. The, the corporate works of mercy, you know, to, to, to show the love of Christ to others. Because when you do it to the least of my brethren, you've done it to Christ. You've done it to him. Um, so it's sort of this beautiful image of this is what it's all about. Live out, just as Christ died for us, his little ones, we're called to, to lay down our lives and to care for his little ones. And that's and that's what gives us eternal life. It's when that, that gift he's given us is expressed in care for others. Um, and there's plenty of stories of saints who, you know, um, there's a story of St. Martin Latour, you know, he cut his cloak in two and wrapped it around a, 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 uh, a poor man. And in a dream that night, he saw that Christ came wrapped in that bit of cloak so that he gave that to him himself. Um, there's so many stories of just this beautiful idea of caring for somebody in need. And then there's this this reminder that they've done it for Christ. Um, yeah, so that's chapter 25. That, with the talents, you know, the idea that that e- even something like faith is a gift, right? And how do we invest that faith? And and I, I love that idea that it, if you knew that I was demanding, that's even more of a reason why you should have done this, right? Like, it, it, and and so like. God, there are, God loves us, but he also asks us to love, and we have to reinvest what he gives us, and all of, like, like the idea of mercy, he, he's merciful towards us, well, we have to be merciful towards others, and, and so on, and, and so forth, and I think that um, as Catholics, the idea of evangelization is not something that's necessarily a thing that we're comfortable with, right? And, and there's like a big difference between going up to somebody randomly in the supermarket and being like, you have 10 minutes for me to talk to you about Jesus and like allowing our lives to, to spread the gospel and being able to explain things and talk about stuff to people. I'll never forget one of my favorite moments. Um, I was with my brother and we were waiting. Uh, we were getting crates in the city waiting for a friend. And we were laughing and, and joking with this guy who was uh, from Morocco. And he's like, why are you guys so happy? 
And before I had a chance to say anything, my brother's like, because we've got Jesus. Well, that ended the conversation. The guy didn't talk to us anymore after that. But that idea of, of, of what's our, where is our joy come from? It comes from God. So investing that, that, that gift that God gave us of joy and then like trying to, to, to double that by, by sharing that message with someone else. We pray to the Holy Spirit, asking him to give us those moments where we can share our faith and invest those, those talents that God uh, has given us, whatever they may be. All right, so chapter 26, we're, um, we're now entering into the passion narrative, pretty much. So in the beginning, you see, um, when he finished all this, um, he predicts that he'll after two days, the Passover is coming, and the Son of Man will be crucified. And the chief priests and elders, they come and agree um, it's time to arrest Jesus by stealth and kill him, but not during the, the feast because it will upset people. But, of course, they go back on that. It, looks, it doesn't really, there seems to be no explanation for why they, they changed their mind, but that was, the, um, that was their plan. So this is all happening in the span of that week from the end of Jerusalem, um, Palm Sunday, so now we're at the anointing in Bethany. Um, so Jesus is going to visit. Um, this is the house of Simon the leper. The woman, traditionally seen as uh, Mary Magdalene, comes up and takes an alabaster jar of expensive ointment and pours it on his head as he's at a table. Um, the other story I think we may recall is with his feet and she wipes his hair. This is less sort of dramatic. Um, and so we see the anointing in preparation for his burial. Because as we can recall, when he does die eventually, He's put in the tomb because they're in a rush, and they come back to anoint him. But this is his sort of final anointing, and this is almost this is also the breaking point with Judas because some of the disciples sort of put a waste, and we see this is the moment that Judas goes and betrays Jesus because um, he sort of and Judas is more worried like why not use this to like do some good for the poor like to, to fix our problems. But he's very worldly oriented, and he's making an ultimate rejection of Christ otherworldly orientation. This is not about perfecting this world, it's about preparing for the next. And that's, that's something people struggle with. So what does he say? Um, you will always have the poor with you. You will not always have me. Um, so I think this is a dangerous thing where we just got a passage about caring for the poor and the needy and the sick and the hungry, but that's not what it is all about. If we're so focused on you know social justice, which is important, well, that's not an end, it's a means. To give God glory and to save souls is ultimately, if I help somebody give them food, but I'm not worried about their soul, I haven't done my job. So this is often an argument we get, you know, why does the church have beautiful statues and, and gold and beautiful buildings? Well, it's about a both ends. We care for the poor, but just as much our job is to, to, to build reverence and devotion to God. You know, a beautiful church is a gift for everybody. Anybody can go in. And encounter God and find solace in prayer and salvation in a way that food is great. But if we can give somebody faith through a beautiful church, that's a far greater gift we can give them. So a community, the church should be a reflection of that faith. And, and people just donate and give very generously to support that idea of here's a place where people can encounter God, where we can nourish the soul. And then in addition to that, we have something like social ministry whose worry is to, to nourish the body. And by caring for the body, we can lead others to discover Christ. We become Christ for them, and they see the beauty of the Christian faith is we love one another for the sake of eternal salvation. So Judas is sort of the original naysayer to, to sort of that, that commitment to um, the goal of you know, glorifying God and serving. Uh, and he was also, you know, he wanted this warrior Messiah, not, you know, this the one who's going to die. So we go to verse 17. We start to see um, the Passover, the Last Supper. So they go to the house. They eat together. Um, he predicts that he'll be betrayed. Um, and he sort of points out his Judas. And he says, is it I, Master? He says, well, you have said so. You've said, you know, this is sort of, he puts it on him. And then verse 26, we see the, the institution of the Last Supper. It should be familiar. Um, from the Mass, he took bread, blessed, broke it, and gave it to his disciples. So the Mass has developed where we, we use almost exactly those words, take, eat, 
this is my body. He takes the chalice, drink of it, all of you, for this is the blood of the covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Um, so this new covenant, again, so the covenant was made with Noah, it was made with Moses. This is the new covenant that breaks open the old one. It includes all people, forgiveness of sins, for all those who are willing to drink of it. Um, this is sort of, this is how the, the Jewish faith comes to be destined for all people. In verse 30, we see um, he sort of predicts that all the apostles will, will abandon him. And Peter says, certainly I won't. We know that's going to end. Uh, Christ predicts his betrayal. Um, verse 36, we go up unto Gethsemane. We have the agony in the garden. Uh, he has this moment where he says, my father, if it be possible, let this chalice pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Um, so this is the final sort of acceptance of his mission. You see that the that that tension in his humanity and his divinity. So in his humanity it's very natural to want to protect and sustain oneself, but nevertheless his will is so perfectly united with his divine will that whatever it is, even if it means this painful suffering and death, I'm ready to accept it. Um so again his apostles are sleeping, they we see that sort of inability to, to remain with our Lord in this time of sorrow. Uh, Verse 47, uh, we come to the point of betrayal. Judas comes. They come in the night. They don't, there's sort of this cowardice. Rather than confront him in public where people, they know people are, are adoring him, uh, they come in the dark. And how does he betray him? With a kiss. It's really a, a very very moving image to think. You know, one of Christ's closest friends comes and betrays him with this sign of fellowship. Um, some of the saints speak beautifully of how an unworthy reception of Eucharist is like the kiss of Judas. Because receiving communion is one of the most intimate things we can do. Um, it is the consummation of our relationship with God. We're physically united with Him. We're, we're uniting ourselves with Him on the cross. We're accepting that gift. And if we're in a state of mortal sin or we're not open or you know we're not prepared for that gift, what a disrespect, what a sacrilege to treat Him that way. This, this, what happens in a married relationship is one each becomes vulnerable to the other, opens themselves up, becomes, you know, makes himself susceptible to the other. And God does that for us, and yet we, we sort of betray that gift. Um, and that's sort of what's happening here, that the beautiful love of Christ is being betrayed. Um, one of the apostles cuts off the ear of the servant. Um, in, in the other gospel, it's pointed out that it's Peter here. It's unclear. Matthew tends to favor Peter. It would be the tradition, just as we remember, you know, Peter upon the rock to build my church. Peter is lifted up as this important figure. Um, Jesus goes before Caiaphas, and they're trying to find a false testimony against him. Um, they're trying to sort of, somebody has perjured themselves so that they can find him guilty. Um, and sort of, they focus on, and able to destroy the temple of God and build it in three days. Um, as if he's going to destroy the temple. This is a false charge we can bring against him. They can twist his words. Um, but in that moment, he says, you know, I tell you here, if you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven, so they see this as blasphemy. It's him claiming to be God. And they spit, spit on him and slap him and strike him um, and sort of say that's enough to put him to death. And it's in that moment then that, that Peter comes to betray Christ. You know, they pick up on his accent. They say, you're from the same place. There's a funny way the Galileans say words. And and he denies him three times, and he, he weeps bitterly. So we see that, that sorrow of Peter at having betrayed Christ. So uh, that's our setup in chapter 26 to the Passion. There's a lot there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think that one of the things that's kind of stood out to was the self-righteousness of Judas, right? We hear in other Gospels that, that that idea that he was a thief, and that's why he was so concerned about, we could have used that money, you know. Um, so I, I, there's that temptation, I think, with us sometimes to have self-righteousness, right? And to think that, like you mentioned before, well, if I lived back then, I would never do this, I would never do that, or whatever it may be. And for us, we can be, sometimes we want, to do things to show how good we are, and it's not about doing it for the right reason. And we know that for a moral action to be moral, it, it has to be 
a good act in and of itself, right? So feeding the poor is a good act in and of itself. It has to have the right circumstances, right? So doing it in an appropriate place and in an appropriate manner, but then it also has to have the right intention. So if your intention is to impress other people, if your intention is to get attention, um, if your intention is to climb the, the, the corporate ladder, if you will, then the intention is wrong, but then it makes your action wrong. So that we have to resist that temptation for self-righteousness. And even Peter, there's self-righteousness in Peter. I would never do that. I would never betray you. And then, like, it, and it wasn't even, like, 10 years later he betrayed him. <laughs> it, it was, like, a few hours later that he betrays him. So there's that temptation in our own life, and, and we have to apply that to ourselves, right? Don't be self-righteous because it hurts us. But also, when we're talking to other people, I would never do that. Well, you don't know what you would do until you were in that situation. So to have compassion and to have mercy like Christ has for us. And to think about all of this that he endured out of love for us and, and how he wanted this taken away, but he knew that this was necessary. Um, he did it for our salvation, for his great love of us. And if he could suffer and give his life for us, then we can give our lives for others too. Not only can we, but we should be giving our lives for others. Not necessarily literally, although that might happen, but definitely, you know, metaphorically living our, for, for others and not just for ourselves. All right, chapter 27, we're at final moments. Um, so Jesus is brought to Pilate. The Jewish people don't have the right to capital punishment, to kill Christ. They need sort of the Roman governor to, to decide this. Um, right after that, we see that Judas, he, he realizes what he's done. He's very regressive. He betrayed innocent blood. He tries to give the money back, and they refuse it because it's blood money. Jewish leaders won't take it, and they use it to buy a place to bury foreigners. Um, and then what, is, what, is, what does he do? He, he hangs himself, Judas. Um, so maybe this is the parallel between Christ and Judas is we see that despair in Judas. He, he cannot ask for forgiveness or accept forgiveness. He, he despairs of leaving that sin behind, so he ends his own life. He becomes this image of what happens in sin when we don't turn to God. Um, our, our souls sort of crumble. Well, Peter, we know, eventually does say, yes, I love you, you know, that, that scene by the seashore. Um, also, something I missed, so um, the 30 pieces of silver that he accepted um, there's symbolic significance because in the Old Testament, it's, if a slave gets scored, it's, it's worth 30 pieces of silver. So this this menial amount of money that shows that Christ is sort of this, he's selling Christ for this, this petty amount as if he was a slave. So in verse 11, we start to see Pilate starts to question him. Are you thinking of the Jews? Jesus says, you say so. Again, he doesn't really affirm it. He doesn't, he doesn't speak. He doesn't respond to any of the charges, um, you know, silent as the lamb again from the Psalms, you know. A lamb led to the slaughter. He just he doesn't speak out against the injustice, which is something I often counsel people. We often struggle with the idea, you know, being treated poorly. People are speaking unkindly about. Sometimes we just have to endure injustice because there's nothing we can say. There's nothing we can do to fix it. Like Christ, um, we endure it. And we know that in the end, all things will be revealed. God will reveal the injustice we've endured. Um, sometimes we have to just come to accept the injustice that is around. We of course, we try to fight injustice, but like Christ, he knew there was nothing he could do. He just accepted the cost. Uh, towards verse 15, we see Pilate tries to get out of this. He doesn't want to kill an innocent man. Um, his, his wife was warned in the dream, don't do it. Um, but what happens? So he brings out Barabbas, which is very interesting. He's this you know, political agitator. He killed somebody. He's this zealot who's trying to overthrow Roman authority. And there's Christ. What does Barabbas mean? Son of the Father who is Jesus, true Son of the Father. So what do they do? They choose this Son of the Father, this Messiah, who's worldly, who's going to take political power and overthrow the, the uh, oppressor. Christ is the Messiah who comes to die, who comes to not overthrow worldly power, but to bring about the heavenly kingdom. So the people there choose. So there's sort of this parallel set up. This is who they want. Um, and very often we want a God that's going to fix our lives as opposed to a God who's going to give us heaven. You know, he wants a slot machine in the sky that gives us what we want, as opposed to the God who's going to give us crosses, 
but the ones that save our souls and bring us into heaven. Fast food, Jesus. Right. <laughs> I'll take one of these. I'll take one of these. I'll take one of these. And, he's just and a whole the onion. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so Pilate sees that it's not working out. He washes his hands free of the blood. And, and what do the, the people say? May his blood be upon us and upon our children. So somebody accused Matthew of being a bit anti-Semitic, sort of pinning the blame on the Jewish people. Of course, the Second Vatican Council is very clear. We don't blame the Jewish people for the death of Christ. All of us are responsible. And that's, again, you know, we can't look back and blame them. No, all of us in that time could very well have done the same. If we've sinned, we've rejected Christ in the way that they did. So all of us put Christ on the cross. That's the beauty of Palm Sunday when we, or Good Friday when we read the Passion. We all shout, crucify him. We're all responsible for his death. There's a, a, a beautiful and dark irony when we get to verse 27. Is So the whole charge against him is that he's king of the Jews. And so they start mocking him. They put a scarlet robe and a crown of thorns, and they kneel and say, hell, he of the Jews. Um, so in a sense, they're speaking the truth without realizing it. You know, mocking him as this king, not knowing he is king. And, and we know his crown is of thorns. His means of kingship is suffering. His, his throne is the cross. Um, so we think of Christ the king. This is how he reigns in sorrow and brokenness. But that's how he wins over our hearts. That's how he rules is by the invitation of love, not the, the grabbing of power. And that's, there's two ways to open somebody's heart. You can, well, you can force somebody to do something, or through your love, the invitation that Christ extends, um, that is how he chooses to save us. So in verse 32, we start to see the story of he's, he carries the cross. Simon of Cyrene helps him to carry it. Um, they offer him wine mixed with gall, which is almost like a, something to, to dull the pain, but he refuses it. Because he, he drinks that pain and suffering to the dregs. He takes all of the deaths of suffering on himself, the rejection by his friends, the rejection by all people, the, the physical pain. He, he goes to the deepest depths so that he can lift it all up and take it from us. Um, so he refuses even that small comfort to completely take it upon himself. And here they, they divide his garments and cast lots. Again, this is from the Psalms, this sort of prediction, or the suffering, you know, the story of the suffering servant, um, they they divided his garment, um, and they sort of say, "You would destroy the temple, you know, save yourself. You saved others." They they mock him, um, you know, it, again over his cross. This is Jesus, King of the Jews. There's no more accurate statement than what's written over his cross. Um, this is where he is king. So down to verse 45. The sixth hour, there was a darkness over the land until the ninth hour. So we traditionally say Jesus was put on the cross at nine. Darkness covered the earth at noon. And from three hours, there was darkness until 3 p.m. And that's when he died. That's why we have the Good Friday service at 3 p.m. And there's a beautiful custom of sort of being silent and prayerful in those hours of 12 to 3. And he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? A reference to a psalm. That also the ends with trust in God. You know, I feel forsaken. My enemies are around me. I'm beaten and broken. But I know, God, you're with me. I know you're there to lift me up. I know you're there to save me. You are the great sort of redeemer. So he's not really expressing abandonment as much as saying, God, I trust you as much as I am abandoned. Um, so they take a wine, a, a sponge full of vinegar. Um, they ask if Elijah will come to save him. He's crying out to, to Elijah. And then verse 50 with a loud voice, cried again with a loud voice, and yielded up his spirit. So what's important there is this is an active verb. His life isn't taken from him. He hands it over, yields his spirit up to God. So from the very beginning, and he was born of Mary, to this point, he is the, the actor, the protagonist. Nothing is being done to him that he does not permit and choose and will. And then there's this sort of dramatic... The curtain of the temple is torn in two. There's an earthquake. The tombs are open. Bodies of saints are rising. So it's a pretty, you know, wild moment. Um, and of course, the, the temple is broken. The, the veil is torn. There was no Ark of the Covenant anymore. So it's revealed that the temple is empty. This is not where God is. Christ was God, and His His presence now transcends and draws us all in. And then the centurion, sort of this first model of faith, seeing. 
the crucified Lord, seeing all this happen, truly this this, uh, this confession of faith, the moment of Christ's death. So the women come, it's really women in St. John who are there with Christ throughout the suffering. Uh, Joseph of Arimathea takes the body and they, they put him, they wrap him in a living shroud and lay him in the tomb, you know, the shroud of Turin, um, and they roll the stone. Uh, they set a guard because they're afraid that they're going to come and steal the body and pretend Jesus has raised from the dead. And that's verse 27, chapter 27. Once again, there's a lot. <laughs> yeah. I always love one of my favorite moments in, in all of this is that guard, right? And we see that those who had him crucified were the ones that saw all of these miracles, all of these signs that he was the Messiah. And yet in, the, in all of the greatness of the things that he did, the greatest thing he did was not giving someone sight back or all this. It was, it was dying was the greatest thing he did, dying for our sins, and then obviously rising from the dead, but that doesn't happen yet. Um, well, it happens in, 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 next, <laughs> in next, but, you know, that idea that the greatest act was that that total gift uh, of self, and that the centurion witnesses that. And that, that's not to say that you know, who knows what he knew or didn't know before, before that moment, but, uh, yeah, that this selflessness, so important. And, and so chapter 28 is actually surprisingly brief. Um, Matthew's gospel doesn't give us too much detail about the resurrection. So what happens? You know, the stone is rolled back. They appear. You know, they see this angel and you know looks lightning white as snow. Um, and he says, "Do not be afraid, for I know that you see Jesus was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen. To come to see the place where he lay." So they, they show him he is gone. Um, so they depart, and they see Jesus, and they, they recognize sort of his glory. And he says, again, do not be afraid. Uh, this constant reminder that it's almost this, a holy terror, again, of this sort of encountering this beautiful and, and dazzling glorified Christ. Um, so the soldiers lie to say they took the body, sort of cover it up. And then at the end of the gospel, verse 16, Jesus says, you know, I give you all authority in heaven and on earth. Um, go forth, give therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptize them in the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, behold them with you always to close of the age. This final, what is our job to baptize? If you don't believe in the sacraments, well, it's pretty clear here. Baptize them with water, <laughs> Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Like, very simple, still what we do, very clear. Teach them the commandments, and I will be with you. I mean, I think no better image the Eucharist. You know, I will be present to you to the end of the age. The Holy Spirit, the Eucharist, is this abiding presence where we know that God will support us and be with us. What a, what a great way to end. Yeah, it's uh, a message of hope. I, I'll, this one, when I was involved in the RCIA when I was at St. Patrick's in Smithtown, and um, one of the people that we worked with was a man from China, and he said that his whole life he grew out without faith. And he just felt like it had to be something more. And when he came to this country, he was looking into everything. And he came to the parish and was asking one of the priests if we had a Bible study, and the priest said to talk to me. And then we talked, I said, we don't have a Bible study per se, um, but we have uh, RCIA, and you can learn about what we believe in. Catholic. He came and he was like, "This is I believe this. This is this is where I'm supposed to be. I know this is what I'm where I'm supposed to be." He ended up having to go back home because his father was sick, and uh, he was like, "Well, what happens to me now?" And I said, "I don't. I mean, is it safe for you to become Catholic?" And he was like, well, "I don't know if I'll be able to practice. I don't. And, you know, all these other things." And he talked about you know the under church and you know how does one find the underground church you have too many people that you, can, you know so uh, he ended up being baptized confirmed received first holy communion um, and we, we members of the RCIA team and myself will email him from time to time and that's he always echoes these lines from scriptures even though I can't worship even though I'm not in a place where there's a church that I know that that, that Christ is with me um, and how important it is for us to remember that, that he is always 
with us, no matter what's going on. When we're on the cross and we feel abandoned, right? You know, why have you forsaken me, God? We are there with Christ on the cross with him. So even in our worst and most dark moments, we're there with Jesus. Jesus went and and took on all the suffering uh, of the, not only, like you said, the physical suffering, but the suffering of sin and everything. So even in our suffering, he is with us and we are with him or we, we can be with him. We can choose not to be with him, but he is always with us. You know, and that's, um, and maybe just final thoughts. Um, so hope we sort of whirlwind tour through this gospel. Um, but I think maybe hope we start to see there's, there's limitless depths. You know, this is, it, it captures mysteries which we'll never understand it completely. So there's something we can go back to over and over and over again. So I'd encourage you, you know, one, sit and read the scriptures, read the gospel again, and you'll get more out of it. And read it with a commentary. There's the Navarre commentary, which goes through each passage and gives you little background, little extra bits to reflect on. Um, read something like The Life of Christ by Fulton Sheen, which goes through these stories and gives context and richness and reflection to it. Um, we can keep digging and, and encountering more from these stories, things that will stay with us. Um, so that's my first sort of hope. And then the second, um, you know, hopefully we see and we think about what would it have been like to encounter the story for the first time. You know, we often think of this as like this this static book, you know, something you read, the biography, but, but this is like a living document that's meant to tell people who Christ is. You can encounter him. This is a something that's alive. And, and the people who lived in that time would have encountered Christ in the same way that we're encountering him here. You know, that's what it's meant to be. So not to read this as a story, but to say, you know, what is Christ telling me? How is Christ trying to change my life? What is the point of this is that I should read it and walk away from it different. That's the whole point of the scripture. That's the whole point of Christ. And it helps us do that. We enter into it with prayer, with trust in the church, and that right sort of mindset where we're open to God here. So this is something we're hoping to keep doing. We'll have, uh, we're talking about maybe doing the, uh, the Acts of the Apostles next, something that people might not be as familiar with. We're going to take a break. But uh, the hope is that we're appreciating this opportunity to dig into the scriptures and, and allow them to transform us. One side note for everybody too: during the uh, during the break that we're going to be taking the next couple of weeks from Bible study, uh, Harrison and Dennis, our seminarians, are going to be leading a uh, um, like like this, like a podcast kind of talk style about different ancient heresies and how they're alive today in modern culture. So that'll be pretty cool. So over the next couple of weeks, there'll be information coming out on that, but you'll want to tune into that. So yeah, follow McCall, Great, any no. last thoughts. <laughs> You got a heresy horn ready? I, I got to download one. That's going to be my project before. Uh, the first one is on Tuesday, so as long as I get one before that. I think I think it should be something that sounds like this. <laughs> I'll have to, I'll have to really? download it. <laughs> I'll have to download that. A lot of heresies have been remixed. Yeah. Right, that's a good, that's a deep, beautiful insight. <laughs> they look, they look very, they say the same stuff, just a different day. Yeah. Yeah, sweet. Okay. No, no, so thank you, Father McGaldy, for joining us. Thank you for listening. Thank you, uh, Nick, for uh, putting this all together. Ah, no problem. Anytime. Cool. All right. Uh, Father, you want to lead us in uh, closing with the Ave Maria? Sure. Santa Maria, Mater Dei, Ora pro nobis peccatoribus, nuke et in order mortis nostre. Amen. God bless you all, the Father, the Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.